So if you have not been up to speed with uh, this particular series, uh, I'll just kind of high level hit you with where we're at and where we started. Uh, the Chosen People, week one, we actually looked at uh, really some of the worst anti-Semitic things that Martin Luther ever said. Uh, to be brutally honest, you probably none of, no Lutheran ever knew of it, never heard of it, never sat through a class with it. Uh, we looked at what that was about and we looked at what were the things that, that he had said prior where he was very much for the Jewish people, uh, and then what happened over a 10-year period where he then took a position against the Jewish people, and then we looked at Scripture and how that collided with the person of Jesus and how different that looked, frankly, in the person of Jesus. So we started that off super awkward in, in week one, and just to kind of do some level setting, I think at a minimum, for followers of Jesus, especially if you're attending in this church, to at least try to build some trust and credibility with you that it's very easy um, <clears throat> to bend scripture or to omit scripture or avoid scripture so that you kind of make it neatly fit into whatever your political leanings may be or your comfort zone. And, and most of the time you'll we'll find that when Jesus fits cleanly into our lives, it's probably not the Jesus of scripture that we're worshiping. It's probably a version of ourselves that we're worshiping. I know that's offensive, but it's, you know, it's true. So what I want to attempt to do is have you walk in the mess that is humanity with what's playing out on the world stage. That was the point of this series. And that resolve is really found in Jesus. Now, I want you to know, if, if I hadn't already made this clear, I have political leanings. I'm a conservative male. I have political leanings. And let me just tell you, here's the challenge, right? And so we're 100% clear. Love America greatest nation ever created. These are my personal beliefs, okay? So we know, there's my cards, okay? But here's the problem. The problem is I know that when I die, Jesus isn't going to look at me specifically as a pastor and say, well done, good and faithful American. He's just not. So unfortunately, or fortunately, I have to, as your pastor, wade into the things that even make me uncomfortable, that are even inconvenient for me. You know, like, love your enemies. Not a fan of that, but he said to do it. Pray for them. Are you kidding me? Sounds good. So if I would have been a disciple 2,000 years ago, I'd be like Simon the Zealot. There'd be no quotes of me anywhere in Scripture, okay? Because all of that makes, is, creates angst in me, but that's what he said. And I can't trust in the words that grant me eternal life and then ignore all the things of what it looks like to live out life before I have eternal life. It doesn't work that way. So first we looked at Luther, the good, bad, and the ugly. Needed to understand that and acknowledge it, okay? Then we looked at Islam and tried to boil things down to the revolutionary name Muhammad. And if we were in any other country cultural context with the things that we said about Muhammad that day, there the problems that would be on our doorstep the next day or that day would be shocking. So everything about defiling the prophet Muhammad, we did it, okay? And help people understand that ultimately what you're seeing playing out on the world stage looks like Muhammad. Steal, kill, lie, enslavement, pedophilia. Muhammad, okay? Well, then the next week, then we looked at Israel. And it's really easy to throw in your lot with Israel as an American. And, and I... I wanted to help us understand what were the theological things that feed into that, like the Schofield Bible that came out in, you know, right around the 1940s, and what was that trying to instill in people, and why was that there, and what does it look like for then the other side of the argument to also not have Jesus? What does that look like? It means you do things like Joshua in the Old Testament, and you do things like David in the Old Testament, which is kill them all. So, when you put it all in that context, what you're seeing, whether we like it or not, starts to make, for better or for worse, a lot of sense. And what does it look like when Jesus isn't in the middle of what's happening? No one's like Jesus. And that's what I wanted to help us see more clearly. There's no one like Jesus. He's set apart by himself. And in this whole thing, there's also another piece, okay, the Palestinians. And I wanted to look at just, this is probably one of the most concise videos to explain 
in a world that wants to only give you two options with every problem you ever face. You ever notice that? That's how you divide and conquer a people. You set the table. It's either this or this. And then when you pick that side, they go, ah, see, what about that, that, and that? You pick this side, and then the culture and media goes, well, what about that, that, and that? It's designed for you to lose. It's designed to, to divide and conquer, and that's how it works. And they always tried this with Jesus, with the Pharisees. Is divorce this, or is divorce that? Jesus. Or do we give to Caesar, or do we not give to Caesar? Jesus. And every time he had a way of transcending their argument that really ultimately brought about that it was their hearts were the issue. They were actually disobedient in even asking the question. And what I want to help you see is, even when it comes to Palestinian people, this also is messy. And I, this is one of the best videos I could find in all of the research I did, opposition research to my own bias the best I could, everything else. I think what he has to say here is quite valuable. Check out this clip. Why aren't more Arab countries in the Middle East taking in Palestinian refugees? The onset of a renewed war between Israel and Hamas has led to fears that millions of Palestinian people living in the Gaza Strip may be forced to become refugees. For example, in 1991, the Kuwaiti government actually expelled nearly 300,000 Palestinians in the aftermath of the first Gulf War. And this represented an astonishing 18% of Kuwait's entire population. So what was the reason? Well, the Palestinian Liberation Organization had actually supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait a year earlier. And this support only grew after Iraq began attacking Israel with rockets throughout the war. After Kuwait's liberation, the government considered much of the Palestinian community to be complicit in the Iraqi occupation of their country. And in response, nearly all Palestinians were deported in just a few months. And this wasn't the first time something like this had happened. Decades earlier, the Palestinian groups operating in Jordan had come to openly call for the overthrow of Jordan's monarchy in the aftermath of the Six-Day War. At the time, the PLO maintained its own separate army on Jordanian soil and used that armed force to sow chaos. Armed gangs of PLO militants drove around the capital of Amman, robbing families and businesses in the name of collecting financial assistance for the ongoing war of attrition against Israel. When members of the Jordanian police and army tried to defend their citizens from these attacks, they were attacked and killed. The Palestinian political network operated as a state within a state, with militants repeatedly using Jordan to launch rockets into Israel. The Marxist-Leninist popular front for the liberation of Palestine even went so far as to hijack multiple planes, diverting the flights to a Palestinian-controlled airfield in Jordan where the passengers were held hostage. By September 1970, the Jordanian army had finally had enough. A full-scale war with the PLO broke out, and after 10 months of fighting, the Palestinians were driven out of the country. Yet, as a parting gift, a Palestinian terrorist group known as Black September assassinated the Jordanian prime minister. Sadly, the story doesn't end there, because the PLO then moved into Lebanon, where they allied themselves with Marxist and socialist movements that were seeking to overthrow Lebanon's conservative Maronite Christian government. The presence of thousands of Palestinian militants flooding into the country completely destabilized Lebanon and plunged the entire nation into chaos. Less than four years after the PLO was expelled from Jordan, Lebanon found itself in the middle of one of the most bloody and chaotic civil wars in Middle Eastern history, from which it has never fully recovered. In short, Palestinian organizations have not just attacked Israel. They have sowed unrest in many of the neighboring Arab and Muslim countries as well. And this has led those governments to the conclusion that allowing for mass immigration or even just refugee camp resettlement within their borders would lead to domestic unrest for their own countries. And this, of course, only exacerbates the humanitarian crisis for those Palestinian non-combatants caught in the middle. The problem is, as long as terrorist organizations like Hamas and others are elected to represent the Palestinian people, their plight will most likely continue, as neither Israel nor apparently the surrounding Arab nations want to see their own populations threatened by terrorist groups. So if all that went over your head super fast, all I want you to sum it up is all of those relationships around Palestine are incredibly... Uh, stress and tension filled, wrapped in a history that 80 to 90% of the average American walking around has no clue. And so most people boil the whole issue down to either October 7th, if you're on one side, or the other side tends to kind of halfway ignore October 7th, and their timeline starts October 8th. 
And what I wanted to bring to the forefront over the last several weeks is this kind of starts with Abraham 4,000 years ago. And it is a horrific borderline family feud that goes back between one man not honoring God and sleeping with two different women who each have a child. There you go, see? So this is, this is not just as clean as everyone likes to think. And that's, if anything, I wanted to bring that to the forefront. It's a messy messy situation and innocent people are caught in the middle of all of it see image bearers of God are caught in the middle of this whole mess even Christians quite literally so I wanted to to walk us through a story today that kind of brings out to the forefront the best that we could of what does it look like of, of a situation that Jesus was in that kind of walks in this similar mess okay Uh, And we're going to combine two texts, because Matthew chapter 15 has a story, and then Mark chapter 7. They both talk about the same event, but they bring about different aspects of the story. They're not not in competition, okay? They're complementing each other, not competing. So what I did is I combined the two. Where one didn't have a certain detail, I added that, and I made it a different color. So you'll know if it's Mark, if it's a different color, okay? but it gives you even a fuller understanding of what's being described. They're just two different guys, Matthew, Mark, with two different audiences, and then they're catching two different levels of, of you know, detail. That's what's happening and what they're seeing. So here, kind of combine the two. You'll notice the difference in the coloring difference. So here it is. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, what, what is, why does that matter? All of Jesus' ministry, he's basically in Galilee. He's playing home games all the time. Fellow Jews. That's what he's doing. He leaves the region. Now he kind of leaves the region because he's been pushing the nuclear code already to find himself on the cross at some point. And the quickest way to do that is to insult all of the people that everyone else respects, including your own disciples. So he had just come off of Uh, feeding 5,000 people. And on the heels of feeding 5,000 people, he also insults all of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to the point that even his own disciples were like, hey, we like that guy. That's a good guy. And Jesus is like, nope, whitewashed tomb. You know, he's just, and Jesus is pointing out, they all look good to you guys. They all look faithful And you think it's all about what you outwardly eat and what you put into your body and what's clean and unclean. And you have 613 laws now. You went from 10 commandments to 613 laws of what you can and can't do and what's clean and unclean. And Jesus is like, you guys are not, you're not getting it. It's about what comes out of the heart. You see something that looks great from the outside. I see the condition of the human heart. And I'm telling you what's on the inside isn't clean. They're all offended. This is what he's just coming off of in this moment. Tyre and Sidon is north of Galilee. It is the area that is, in effect, a pagan Gentile region. The person that he's about to have an interaction with, as you're going to see in the text, is a Canaanite-like ancestor of the Canaanites, more or less. Now, what were the Canaanites? I'm just high level, but just so you understand, okay? The Canaanites, homosexuality bestiality, pedophilia, temple worship. These are the people that in the Old Testament, the Canaanites, were told by God, wipe them out. All of them. All of them. If you were on the other side, if I could push the point a little bit further, you would have seen this as a genocide. Not everyone got killed. And this is a woman who as they're about to be identified in Matthew and Mark, is a descendant of these people. This is what's about to happen. Now to the disciples, this is baffling. Why are we leaving our region? Why are we even going to mix it up? And they never get an answer. There's no idea. They just all of a sudden, Jesus is like, let's head north to a group of people we have historically hated for thousands of years. Let's go, boys. And so that's what's happening in Tyre and Sidon. But there's the backdrop of the region, the people. You're not getting along, okay? Not all that different from what you just saw, okay? So here it is. 
It says, he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syria and Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Now, I just want to hit pause on this woman's situation. Because, you know, it's interesting, our lists. We like Jesus to be the uh, cosmic Santa Claus. Here's my wish list. I want this. I want that. Fix this. Fix that. This is stressing me out. Work on this for me. I need this to work out. Yada, yada, yada. And we go down the list, and we, he checks it if we're naughty or we're nice, and we think if we're nice enough, we'll get it. This is how it works out, right? And we have our list. Here's what's interesting with human beings and their list, is when it really, really gets bad, it's interesting how short a human being's list will get. You take a person and you ask them, well, what are you crying out to God for? And it'll be 25 items. The wants and their needs, all jumbled up and mixed, indistinguishable. Give that same person cancer and their list gets really short. They want like, I don't know, one thing. Ask a person what do they want in this life and all of a sudden have a child of theirs go wayward to the point that it's breaking their heart. Then ask them what do they want. Try to see what a person's desires would be and what they would most ask God and then all of a sudden have their marriage on the rocks and absolutely on fire or have them lose their spouse. Our lists get really, really, really short when things get really, really, really bad. All of a sudden, the things that are just details and ancillary get put in that junk drawer of our lives because they never really actually mattered nearly as much as the most important things in life. And so often, it's too bad, but it's the way it is. It's the way we're made it's our broken and fallen nature. It's not until it's really bad are we so crystal clear on the things that we really want in this life. There's plenty of people right now in Herman Hospital and everywhere else, every other hospital down there, down in downtown right now, who all they want is for the sunshine to hit them on the face one last time. But who in here is thinking that? See? So when it gets really, really serious, Life gets really, really oddly clear on what we need from God. And this woman is crystal clear what she wants and what she needs. And it's her child is possessed. She's tried everything. She sought out friends and family's help. They gave her every kind of input of what she should do and how she should white knuckle to fix it. And somehow by sheer will fix her daughter. And she can't. And now she's desperate. There's nowhere else to turn. There's no one else that can fix her. There's no one else that can help her. She has no other options. Here's what happened. She says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, this is interesting. She identifies him as Lord and the son of David. She knows this title. We don't know yet, how does she know the title? And we don't know yet, is that significant or not? But it's interesting that a person who didn't grow up with this background would use that title with Jesus. Verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Do you know what the disciples' perspective is? Their perspective is not, don't help her. Their perspective is, we're hungry, we're tired, help her, shut her up, and move her on. That's it. Do that thing you do, you know, the thing that you do, fix her situation so we can leave now. 
Because they're done. They're tired. They're out of it. Okay? And here's what happens. He answered in verse 24. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. It's interesting to read how much effort we put in to not acknowledging what an absolute insult that is that Jesus just used. Jesus is a lot of things. I would argue one of the things that Jesus is not is nice. He is compassionate. He is love. He is caring. He would trade and did trade his life for yours. But he can also be extremely direct and to the point. Now, what is he saying about dogs? He's pointing out that, listen, I have this ministry. And the ministry I was given is to reach the children of Israel. That's my purpose. But he has a whole other thing that's happening right now with the disciples. He just got, telling, got done telling them and showing them what people look like who have no interest in following him. Who actually their hearts are far from the person of Jesus. So Jesus is now also going to show them in a very real sense, what does real faith look like? Jesus already knows the disposition of this woman's heart. Jesus already knows her faithfulness. But Jesus also is about to show his disciples, what does real true faith look like? What does it sound like? Right now, she already has the gall and the guts to approach him. A man of different ethnicity, a different race, a people who despised one another, a male to a female, which would have been a female to a male, which would have been a big deal, no doubt, 2,000 years ago. She is stepping over every taboo that she can to get to him. See? And he, Jesus, is surrounded by disciples who still don't get the gravity of what faith looks like to want Jesus more than anything else, to acknowledge his power more than anything else. And they've come now from dealing with people who should get it but don't get it. People who should be following him and have the law and the prophets and have all the writings and have all the history and have all the education, but when it really comes down to it, what's inside isn't there. So here's this woman, this divine appointment, and he's going to show them what real faith actually looks like. Step one, he's quiet. Step two, reminds her. It's just the dogs. You're like the child's pet. That's it. Children of Israel. And here's what she says. She doesn't argue. She doesn't push back. She doesn't even try to defend the comment. She says, yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the children's crumbs that fall from their master's table. Anybody in here have a dog? We had a Shih Tzu for 14, month, 14 years. I thought we were clean people for 14 years. I had no idea what slobs we actually were when we eat in our home with three kids. Why did I not know? We had a living, breathing vacuum cleaner under our table every meal. There was never crumbs under our table ever because the little man was under there cleaning up all day, every day. It wasn't until our dog passed that we get up after the first meal, and I'm like, what a bunch of slobs. What happened to us? And I'm like, wow. And he knew, see? He knew. Meal time. You couldn't find him anywhere. Where is he? Under the table, right? Waiting. Just waiting. He knows. This is meal time. This is better than anything else. They're going to serve me over there in that bowl. I'm going to wait under the table. And anyone here with a dog, you get that. And I want you to envision a table of what's happening in this collision. Imagine an amazing banquet table that God has set up. Fine china, silverware to the nines. The crystal is out. And all of the people that he's inviting to be seated at this table. And yet the majority of the table is empty. 
empty chairs. This meal is for them, lady. But as he's finding out, nobody wants to sit there. And here's this woman saying, I don't even care if I'm the family pet. I'll take it. See, and on the heels of that, what now the disciples understand is when you combine her tenacity to even speak to him, to pursue him, to then even kind of get slapped in the face with the reminder of who his sole focus is, and yet she doesn't even blink an eye. Even the disciples now as mere human beings have to concede, wow, this woman is all in. She will take whatever Jesus can give because the crumbs from Jesus and the crumbs that Jesus will give will sustain her for a lifetime. See? The meal that the culture and society and all of the media and everything in your world will ever fill you up on is nothing more than candy that will make you sick. It feels good for a moment, but inevitably it doesn't sustain. Inevitably it's not good for you. Inevitably it's hollow feeling. And all he's trying to say is the crumbs that fall from heaven are more sustaining of what they will do for God's people than anything else that could ever be offered to you. Verse 28, then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Jesus has only said this twice. The other time was a Gentile soldier, a Roman centurion. Jesus has acknowledged and celebrate a person's faith, and both times they were the people who were otherwise the dog class. Happens twice, and it's not the people at the table, it's the people that were seated under the table, and they're the ones who get it. And the disciples are in earshot this whole time. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed at that moment. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. I'm not saying that your problems in this room don't matter. I'm not saying that the world that you live in isn't a mixed up, messed up mess, whether it's as big and on such a grand scale that's almost un unfathomable of that of Palestine and Israel and the Gaza Strip and how on earth would Jesus ever fix that or how could God ever intervene and do any kind of a healing work in any of that whether it's at that scale or it's all the way down brought down into your own heart or it's brought down into your own living room or some aspect of your life with your family or something that's going on in your world all of it's important but what Jesus is is wanting, and this is the hardest part, what Jesus is wanting is people who follow him to find that he is enough. Regardless of what he gives. Regardless of what the checklist is. That even if he says no to your list, the crumbs that would fall from the table would be enough for us to sustain us. That what he does give is all that we would ever want because to have his presence would be enough. And this is the beauty of Jesus because if we're honest, it's never enough for any of us, <laughs> myself included. It never is. So there's only one way to fix that, see? And the only way to fix that is to finally come down in human form, walk like human beings, talk like human beings, unlike human beings, never mess up, never falter, never fall, and then trade your life on a cross and pay the penalty for sin, death, and the power of Satan in their place. So that no matter what happens, he makes a sure way, and you saw it this morning, that he will be enough and he will carry his people and he will love them 
And he will see them through by his grace, his mercy, his power, his love for each and every one of you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your power and your love. We thank you, God, that you stepped over out of cultures and customs so often. You love the least, the last, and the lost. And we thank you for this beautiful example. It had to have just been stunned faces at the interaction you were even having with this woman. And yet then to show and teach others, as you've taught us this morning, what faith looks like. To come before you and to plead in simple faith and trust that you are who you say you are. May the crumbs that fall from heaven be enough for us in this room. May the crumbs that fall from heaven be what sustains us. Nothing else in this world, nothing else they could give compares to what you offer. So we love you. We thank you. We praise you, Jesus. Amen.